Hello and welcome to another edition of the School Safety Free Period Podcast. I'm Amanda Klinger. And I'm Dr. Amy Klinger. And we are with the Educators School Safety Network. We're a national nonprofit and we provide school safety training and professional development and technical assistance to K-12 schools throughout the United States and Canada. And although normally we are very serious and very academic and very professional, uh, every once in a while we take a little bit of time and do this, our school safety free period, which we're, we're a little bit less formal and a little bit less serious, but we're still talking about critical uh, school safety issues that you all face in your work as educators and school leaders. So Dr. Klinger, what do you have for us to discuss today? Well, it's back to school. I mean, does it seem possible, but it is, in fact, back to school. Wesley, cheer. Yay, back to school. Oh, I don't know. I don't think anyone's cheering. <laughs> Just trying to be supportive. But but actually, thinking about back to school before we launch into the actual thing we should talk about, I do have, I, I was thinking the other day, isn't it, does it, is it hotter back to school than it used to be, like, historically, like, or was it always this hot when we go back to school? Is that like a climate change question? Or no, I, it feels hotter. It's just a question of like, <laughs> it seems so hot. I guess because we've been in a couple of schools lately where they didn't have air conditioning in everywhere. And everybody assumes, oh, it's 2024. All schools have air conditioning. Oh, no. None. Not all schools have air conditioning. So... I guess we're just thinking cool thoughts for those people that don't. Uh, Because you know what? I taught, I never taught in a school that had air conditioning. And so you are saying literal temperature heat. You're not talking about like, it's so hot right now to go back to school. Uh, No. And it's very cool to be in your building. No. You're talking literal temperature. I'm saying it's interesting that in all my years in education, I never had uh, an air conditioned space. And it just didn't seem as hot as it does now. Maybe we're all spoiled. But that's, in fact, not what we wanted to talk about, yes. So we did want to talk about back to school. And back to school is the time when you get new crayons and you get cool shoes and you get all the cool things, uh, a nice school box, all the cool things, and a trapper, all the things that people like. And you get to be dramatized uh, in the first probably the first month or two of school, in some cases, when they do their first active shooter drill. And I just want to make sure to preface this by saying we are not in any way advocating for such things or saying that they, in fact, are necessary. Um, I think sometimes they're happening everywhere. It's not happening everywhere. And I think sometimes uh, when we get into discussions with folks about these uh, there is sort of a prevailing feeling that they are a necessary evil, that uh, this is required by law, or our law enforcement said it had to be done this way, or it or, needs to be realistic, or you won't get any. We need to scare these teachers straight. And, you know, the pushback that we always have is, yeah, there are, you know, different states have different requirements about lockdown drills. There are often specific requirements there is a lot of value in working collaborative, collaboratively with your local law enforcement. But even with all of those constraints, it absolutely is not necessary for preparedness of safety to have ultra-realistic, ultra-scary drills that traumatize faculty and staff, and sometimes in extreme cases, students as well. So, so what are we talking about specifically? Well, I think that what I'm referring to is when we go, oh, no, we got to do an active shoot. We got to do a lockdown drill, it says, by a certain time. So we're going to do a lockdown drill. That means it must, therefore, be an active shooter because there is no other reason to go into lockdown, which is not true. So that's, yeah, let's dig into that for a second. So that's the very first one. Almost uh, all states have requirements that schools practice a lockdown drill. A lockdown protocol. A dog lockdown protocol. And typically, it is not specific that the scenario that you must practice is a traditional textbook rampage style active shooter. It can be. There are other reasons, lower level, less serious, less traumatic reasons why you might need to enter a lockdown response posture. 
And so that would be the first thing to kind of consider. Can we still practice? How would we secure kids? How would we rapidly evacuate? How would we do these sort of things? But maybe we would contemplate it for a different type of a scenario. Well, and let's let's unpack that for a minute, because here's what the problem is. So if you take a kid that is, let's say, in 10th grade, they have more than likely had 10 years of active shooter-oriented lockdown drills. So probably 20 or 30 they've experienced. And so you have built this muscle memory and this association that when we go into lockdown, it's an active shooter. And so then we wonder why is it traumatizing? Because that's the only thing that we have always, always contemplated. And when we need to go into a lockdown for something that is not, in fact, an active shooter, people are still going to respond as though it is. So we have really trained people in some ways to respond inappropriately or ineffectively to to the the stimulus of we're going into a lockdown protocol. And then you can also add the effect of we've had so many of these practices for a lockdown that heaven forbid we actually are in a lockdown for an active shooter. We know that there is the tendency for people to think, ugh, it's just another one of those drills. We do them all the time. As opposed to we are doing a lot of drills on a lot of different scenarios. We're practicing a lot of skills and capabilities and and that it, it does not become so rote or routine uh, that that we, you know, feel like when it something actually happens that, ah, yeah, it's just another one of those. Yeah, drills. but, you know, I want to push back a little bit on that. I think that, which is a very legitimate thing that happens, that or the Craig Wolf sort of thing, I think that often comes from the overuse of lockdown for lower level of that. Sure. Well, of, so something we are having leveled lockdown. Yeah, I think thing. two or three police cars gathered at a house down the street. Let's go into lockdown. Yeah. And and it's the same level or the same intensity yeah. or the same protocol as if, in fact, there were an active shooter. And that's where you get into, and we saw this in Uvalde, where they had had so many lockdowns. And they were not differentiating between, or many schools don't differentiate between the levels or the intensity or the threat level, that you're treating it all exactly the same. Yeah. And that's when you really get into that, oh, here we go again. It's just another one of those. So I think that's one of the, the downsides. Yeah. The second thing that, that we see quite often is that we have not really, whether it's leadership or whoever, has not had a thoughtful reflection on what are we trying to accomplish. So we need to have a lockdown drill. What are we trying to accomplish as opposed to we need to have a, we need to have a lockdown drill. So there we go. Let's just do it. So you're speaking of the notion of instead of let's check the box, right? We have to check this box. We have to do it. It's the first day of school. It's the whatever, whatever. We have to check this box so that we have met this expectation. You're saying instead to go. No, I'm saying when you combine that with the philosophical approach of, hey, it just has to be scary. It is what it is. Let's right. just do it. It's like, you know, let's just give you that shot and just give it to you and just take it and be done. As opposed to we have to do an active, we have to do a locker or a lockdown drill. What could we accomplish in terms of showing people alternative exits or what could we accomplish in terms of kids learning to quiet down and take directions or what can we all of these different things that are safety skills that would be really beneficial far beyond an active shooter drill and so when we take the approach of lockdown drills as just like a thing we got to do and it's got to be messy and ugly but it's only for five minutes or 15 minutes that you have to suffer instead of going how can we take this requirement as an opportunity to train for something that would be valuable for kids to know and that I guess is where you need to speak a little bit more to a skills-based approach as opposed to just a compliance-based approach yeah and we've we've done a lot of work with schools that have instead of thinking so much about scenarios 
what are scenarios? What's a scenario? What's another scenario? What's an unlikely scenario? What do we think is a likely scenario? Instead, moving to an approach of what are the skills that our adults here, so our faculty and staff, and our students, what are the skills that they need to know? And so the skills look more like I need students to be able to know that that's a door that actually goes outside if they need to leave this building. And I don't need to think too hard about what are all the potential reasons or scenarios why they'd need to leave the building in a hurry. It's I need them to be able to leave the building in a hurry. I need students to be able to follow directions quickly from me and from other adults that maybe they don't interact with all that often. I need students to be able to know how to regroup and go back to a... I need students to be able to find an adult if they are, for whatever reason, in the bathroom by themselves when something happens. I need them to know how to safely find an adult. I need them to know how to find an adult when there's something that they're concerned about that they want to tell somebody that they, something is a safety concern. And then for, you know, for the adults that I need them to have the safety skills of being able to communicate uh, in non-traditional times of being able to have communication, the other tools of the trade, you know, we talk about the keys or the capability to lock or secure an area. And so instead of saying, what are all of the potential scenarios that we might face? What are the all risks and hazards? Although that is an important exercise, which we talk about in planning, but for our practice and for our drills to think about what are the skills and the capabilities that I need pe people to be able to have and we will build our drills around skill building instead of practicing specific scenarios. And what I find interesting in these sort of trauma-inducing drills, if you will, is that they're not really, they're not in any way centered around skills because they don't actually have the kids leave or barricade. They, they actually, they just raise the imagination of picture yourself running away from a madman with a gun as opposed to let's practice going out this ex this secondary exit yep. and so i think it's interesting that these trauma drills actually deliver a one-two punch of you've got the trauma but not the skill building yeah and you know that really that kind of made me think of something you know that they talk about like in film you know like old timey horror film where they were constrained by budget and so we couldn't create a full model of the monster, right? You couldn't create a full puppet of the monster, so we showed a shadow. And your imagination fills in the scary thing. It makes it worse. And yeah. that actually is more compelling, yeah. more scary, more emotional as a viewer of film. And we have sort of unintentionally done that with these drills. So instead of demystifying, what would a rapid evacuation look like and feel like? Because frankly, practicing a rapid evacuation is not that emotional or scary. It is, I'm building the muscle memory of I could go this way, I could go out that way, I could go this way, I could stay with my class, I could stay with my teacher, we could move quickly together, not in a panic. That does not have the same mystery or emotional, uh, psychological haunting. Yeah, it does not resonate as scarily as imagine if we had to run away. I mean, just, just yeah. literally contrasting those. Imagine if we had to all leave this room together in a hurry. That could potentially, maybe depending on your level of anxiety to begin with, that could seem really, really scary as opposed to, oh, look, we all did it. We all yeah. left this room in a hurry and we ended up outside. It is possible. You it can is it. possible. We did it. And now we've also physically practiced that. But then think yeah. about, but, but what I find also such a contrast is these same schools will do a fire drill and they will never alter the way that they leave the fire drills. So you've done two things. You've said you need to be able to rapidly evacuate from any exit, but we're only going to ever use the same yeah. one for fire. So you've built almost contradicting muscle memory of that noise means I have to go out this door no matter what. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. And, and then I think the final point is we also hear from schools that say, well, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do any of these drills. We're just going to talk about it tabletop with just the adults because we don't want to traumatize the kids. We also have to think about it's sort of like, uh, what do you call that? Oh, where you get the, uh, immunotherapy or whatever you get. 
where they build your tolerance to a reaction. What's it called? I'm, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, I was going to say shock therapy, which is not at all exposure. what I did. Exposure therapy. Yeah. Small film gro- controlled doses of exposure. Right. So if we're going to say we don't want our kids to be traumatized, which is our theme today, we don't want our kids to be traumatized. So therefore, we will never do any drills. And then inevitably, we have a tornado warning and we got to do we have something. Some, we have some sort of low level crisis event that necessitates a response. And the kids are a hot mess yeah. because they have never had these any skills and these anyway. small levels of exposure where you can successfully, as a kid, successfully demonstrate, oh, I do know what to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, they do know how to protect me. And so we've never given them these small injections of the the allergen. We've never given them these small opportunities. And I, and I have a question here as the, the one of the two of us who is not a teacher by training. This, to me, this notion of what you're discussing, what you're advocating for, sounds an awful lot like what I understand to be like scaffolding instruction, where we start low and then we build more and more and more capacity. And it seems like what what sometimes schools are doing where where you're describing, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to have any practice. It'll be too scary. And then inevitably we do have to enter a response posture and it's awful and traumatic. And it sounds like and the ineffective. Let's right. just point that I out. mean, it sounds like the academic equivalent of that would be like, I know you have to take a standardized test in May, but I don't want it to be intense or anxiety inducing. So I'm never going to build the skills I'm never going to do anything that would work towards that thing at the end. I mean, is that the the difference between swimming lessons and going, let me just shove you in the deep end and see what happens. What's the difference between swimming lessons and one day you fell in the pool and hopefully you learned how to float? And and so I think that is really important that there there's trauma that you can that you can induce on kids with a SWAT level drill drill. And then there's trauma that you can induce on kids, which is I am protecting you and we are never talking about, we're never thinking about it, we're never having a hint of it, and then it's going to inevitably happen. So there's trauma on both ends of that spectrum. So like everything else in life, that sort of middle, building that capacity without taking it to a level of insane intensity. And, And frankly, most of the time when we're talking about kids, we could swap out the word kids for teachers and it would be very very similar as well because we see schools that are doing that with their staff they're either subjecting their staff to incredibly inappropriate levels of trauma or they're sheltering their staff and they refuse to talk about it like the belief that if you don't talk about it nobody will know that there's a potential for violence in a school so you're going to get trauma at both ends of that spectrum I want to add one final point that is perhaps the most delicate of all, uh, it, which is this, the sense that oftentimes when you read about in the media or when we work with schools, then they tell us about things that have happened in the past. When you have these incredibly traumatic, incredibly realistic, ultra realistic drills, that there is a component of this that, well, uh, this is what the law enforcement wanted to do to train in the school. And I think a couple or beliefs that that's the only way that law enforcement can train. Right. And so, you know, we always sort of advocate for people to kind of consider, number one, you and you alluded to this earlier, what is the purpose of this drill? If the purpose of a drill or an exercise is for law enforcement officers to have the opportunity to practice a tactical response, and it's just important, which is important. That is something that they can do when the school is closed and they don't need all of the teachers and heaven forbid they don't need students in the school building for law enforcement to be able to tech tactical response. And that makes a lot of sense for local law enforcement to be familiar with the school, to have the opportunity to um, to, to hear what it sounds like and to move throughout the building. So that makes a lot of sense. And kind of the metric that we use for this is if we're talking about faculty and staff or students being involved in an ultra-realistic drill, are they themselves building skills and capabilities or are they props in someone else's drill? Yeah, I remember a few years ago there was reading about one and it had a lot of pictures and things. And it was talking about how they use the theater kids because, you know, 
they love to be dramatic, which, okay. I mean, there's some truth to them. Well, yeah, but it doesn't mean that they ask for this. But they used the theater kids, and it, and I were, they were interviewing this kid with like fake blood, who had yeah fake blood on her, and pinned to her shirt was that she was a fatality, mm-hmm. and she was talking about how she thought it would be really exciting to do this drill, and then in the moment as she was doing it, she's laying there, and she said it made me realize that. Like, this is what's going to, this is what actually would happen. Yeah. And I'm not sure that we need to make that indelible of an impression on kids. Well, that this is what's going to happen at any moment. Here's what I would say. I was not a theater kid. I was a jock growing up. But my understanding of theater kids is that they do enjoy being dramatic and they do enjoy doing that. But there is an element of it that is escapism. So when the theater kids do uh you know the music band as the as the spring musical i don't think that it carries the same psychological impact of i could in fact become a con artist selling music to uh musical instruments to a town in you know 1830 when does that take place i don't even know i was gonna say wow you're you're just digging yourself i really don't in to i just really don't i don't in 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 i don't know that musical Apparently, I, but I think a, a better one is when we do guys and dolls. Right there, you I want to be in guys and dolls because I can wear a cool suit, and we're going to do cute dances. And it doesn't carry the same psychological yeah, weight of I could. You're welcome. I, I saved you. Yeah, thank you. I could become a gangster in 1930s Chicago. Like it just doesn't have the same. It just it, it doesn't wear the same on a kid. And I think to say that. Oh, well, you can just play act that of being injured in a school shooting, lying here on the ground in your own school, you know, the school you attend uh, on a normal day. And, and you haven't said it yet, but you usually do. So I guess I get to say it for a sure. change. I think that your analogy of, well, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet or whatever it is that you always say, that we cannot use that as the excuse for traumatizing kids because here's the bottom line. It doesn't even work. You know, it would be different if you actually made an omelet, but all you did was break the eggs. You didn't make the omelet. And let me put that idiom in context a little bit. I think, was that the wrong idiom? No, it is. But like what usually that is sort of the feeling or the uh, sort of the rationale. rationale from law enforcement folks or then get out of law enforcement, which then get repeated from school people, then gets repeated by school people. But it comes from this notion of, If you are in law enforcement or in the military, you are inevitably going to face these crisis situations. And if you're going to serve in law enforcement and serve in the military, you have to go through a super realistic drill and practice so that you are able to to be able to endure a response because you are in law enforcement or military service. And so that notion of, yeah, some people are going to hate it. In basic training, when I make them do this, some people are going to hate this when they're in the police academy and they'll either wash out or they'll be able to stay in service. And that's the, well, you have to, you know, break some eggs to make an omelet because here we are, we are, you know, law enforcement, we are the military. We have to have people who have these capabilities to respond. And that is just not the case when you're talking about your kindergarten teachers or your seventh grade students. Statistically speaking, they probably won't have to actually respond to an awful, horrific, tragic event. And so instead of saying it, it is worth the cost of the trauma and the anxiety and the fear of the, the unintended consequences of this drill, it's worth the cost because they must be able to respond to an active shooter. No, they must have some skills and capabilities. They must understand how to evacuate a building. They must understand how to find help. They must the adults must understand how to uh, communicate with each other in a crisis event. But you can build those skills and capabilities without having trauma and anxiety. And I think that's the takeaway. Yeah. We are not saying, therefore, school people, it's okay to opt out and go, I don't want to do anything with school safety in any way. That's not at all what we're saying. We're saying that it is more effective and more uh, long-lasting to train people with skills as opposed to, I just need you to be more 
afraid or more anxious or more traumatized. That's not going to actually help kids in in an actual crisis event. So as we go back to school and, and people start looking at, oh, we got to do that first drill by X day, maybe we need to think about that rationale of what is the most important thing I need to teach kids right away at the beginning of the year. I don't know that it's going to be be, be fearful of an active shooter. I think maybe it's more valuable of let's start working on how we get out of here, mm-hmm. regardless of what is the danger that is motivating us to leave the classroom. And so hopefully that's maybe a little different approach that we can take when we look at our back to school drills. So there you have it. Um, We'd love to hear from you. What is your school doing uh, with the skills-based approach? Help. Uh, And if you have any other questions, obviously you can always reach out to us. Our email is info at eschoolsafety.org. That's our website, www.eschoolsafety.org. You can head there for all kinds of free resources, uh, lots of information about the work that we do and different ways that we can help. So thanks so much for joining us, and uh, until next time, thanks.